Stacy, thank you for praise and worship with all the team. I tell you, I was watching some of those musicians up here getting into that swinging and swaying. That's pretty cool. Wow. Welcome to First Assembly. Today is a day that I hope you will never forget because I believe God is setting a direction for us as a church, not just for the next few months, but for probably years down track. It is that significant. I believe God has called us as a church to change the atmosphere of our community, to change the atmosphere in every institution that we touch, because we're living in a day in which many of the leaders of our communities have lost their heart. They have lost their hope in many ways. They're just trying to survive. They think that you and I are living in a community that's repressed and poor. Huh. Huh. I may not have everything, but I want you to know something. I have my Lord. I have my brothers and my sisters, and we are a family of God. And what I want to share with you today is if there is a, if the secular world around us, and many go to churches, but their mindset is that we are repressed. And I'm thinking when the world thinks you're down, God says, look up. I'm serious. I'm sort of like, uh, I don't remember the movie. It was uh, Sutherland. And he says, I don't want any negative waves. Anybody remember that movie? Hogan's Heroes. No. Kelly's Heroes. How about God's Heroes? God doesn't want any negative waves because he's a positive God. And I want to share some things with you. It's not a long sermon. It could get long. It could. I want to take us out of Jeremiah, but I'm going to go to a couple other places before that. I'm going to sort of stick to my notes because my mind is down a dozen different tracks. I am I'm preparing mentally, spiritually, physically. In fact, in a few weeks, thank you, Jesus, I'm going to be 10 or 15 pounds lighter. I'm getting down to fighting weight. Some of you all need to do that too, just a thought. That was free. Some of you need to eat uh, careful. <laughs> I heard that. Be careful over there. Okay. But in June, when we had the power force with us, God caused me to realize something. People in the walls of our schools have been praying for God to come back in. I know we don't hear that from the news media. We don't see that in all the, the sites, but there are principals, there are assistant principals, teachers who pray over their classrooms, who pray and walk down the halls and are believing God and crying out and saying, God, if you don't come back into our schools, we're doomed. How many know that's truth? If he's not God of all, we're out of control and we're already doomed. I can't tell you how many of those who actually are doing that, but I constantly keep hearing it, and it's like a background noise. And I have become convinced in my prayer time that God has heard the prayers of those inside, and yet they are battling from inside, and God says, I am giving you a breach into the halls and the walls of our schools that will now prepare you to be a people to make a difference, to change the whole atmosphere of the school system, not just to change the atmosphere of a school system, but to change the atmosphere of our, all of our community. A community that does not have a good spirit is in danger of really just dying on the limb. God is not one who has brought us to a place to live defeated. He's brought us into a place of promise, and his promises are sure. For weeks, I've taught on spirit-filled warfare, and I've preached on it, and our men's ministry has been focusing on it, and 
I'm more convinced that the time that God has set before us is today. I believe that there is a timing of God, and we either seize the moment and the opportunity, or we will find ourselves wondering, how did we miss that? What was going on? God does not want us to miss a window where the doors are cracked open and the breach is there. Our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of the strongholds of the enemy. In Christ Jesus. Sex says that in Corinthians for you and me. Now, there's a number of things happening over the next few months. We're moving into a new school year. We're going to believe God for our kids. We're going to pray over our kiddos. My granddaughter, I spent yesterday on the phone with her. She just entered the University of Georgia, spending her first weekend. And I prayed with her, and I said, sweetheart, I says, Grandpa is your ally. Grandpa is your protector. I know you got mom and daddy an hour away from you, but at University of Georgia with 40,000 people there, if you need somebody to carry a big stick, I said, if mom and daddy are busy, you call Grandpa. I can be there in four hours. And when I put my foot down, I can be there in three. <laughs> Cars do 160, you know. <laughs> so do troopers, just a thought. <laughs> I'm teasing. I would not think of going too fast. <laughs> Way too much coughing out there. We've got a new school year. Our mission's emphasis. Beloved, God has allowed us to be a powerful missions-giving church, and it's not about the money. It's about people who see the need across the ocean, around the world. But here's what God's saying to me even today. Come on in, Pastor. God's saying to me, what are you going to do under the shadow of the steeple? To win the lost across the ocean, to go around the world 7,500 miles plus, what are you going to do here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and this area? That's my message today is where we're headed. God has impressed on me we cannot lose another generation of our kids. If people are going to talk about the next generation as, as senior leaders of our country, the church better think about the, the church of today, and it's our little ones. Almost 70% of those little ones in schools today have not been in a church building. It's scary. There was a day when you and I were growing up that everybody went to church, even if they didn't really live it. That's not true today. There are parents who have never walked into a church building. I met a lady 37 years old who had never picked up a Bible or been in a church, not even out of curiosity. What do you think that happens with those babies? They go farther from God. This is God's timing. I believe God is taking us from being, how do I say this, defensive-minded, protective, in our own little cocoons, if you will, in our tabernacles, and has called us to be part of the army of God that goes out and takes the fight to the enemy. You can only defend so long. Every general officer that understands war understands there is a time to defend. And you can defend a pretty good little while. But here's two things that happen when you do that. You begin to lose ground and begin to back up even though you're defending. And the second thing is you break the morale of your men and women. And God does not want us to sit in the pew and not take the land that he has promised to us. I don't believe that in a minute. 
the church has submitted themselves to that mindset, well, that's, that's government, that's education, that's this or that. And God said, I desire to be in every aspect of life in your community. Every part of it. The battles are waging. Just look around America and see how many are battling on prayer in a city council. Or the Chamber of Commerce. How many are battling on whether or not God can be mentioned in anything? Beloved, the war is hot. I'm not waiting for some stinking election to prove whether or not we're right or wrong. God says you move when I say move. His timing is divine. And I am feeling the impression upon me so deep. I was looking in the scripture, and the walls of our school are difficult to penetrate. God brought in a a team of three men, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) with with the power force that have gotten into those schools, and now there's principals and others who are saying, please come back. And you and I have invested money into that around this nation. But I want you to know something. God has not forgotten that you have also invested in this community. This is what it says in Luke chapter 11. We read something interesting, and this is not my sermon, but boy, sure sure does give me a picture of how my God works. One day Jesus cast out a demon from a man who couldn't speak. And when the demon was gone, the man began to speak. Now the crowds were amazed, but... Mm -mm -mm. Some of them said, he gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. We are living in a world where people want to exalt Satan above the name of Christ. And Jesus didn't take much time. He took them head on. He was talking to religious. Let me tell you, there are many religious leaders in our communities who have bought in to the secular mindset. But look what he says in verse 21 and 22. When a strong man like Satan is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe. What are the palaces of the enemy today? It's the institutions of this world. It's exactly what it is. Schools included. Satan thinks he's got his heyday because he's educated all the liberal thinkers at the highest schools, and they've come out of schools that once were worshiping kind of schools, were schools built on the Scripture, were schools built on integrity and character, and today we're watching people come out of those schools who have no morals, no values, no integrity. Whatever is acceptable to them is all they want so they can get what they want. You're watching that. On the news all the time. But listen to this. Verse 22. (laughs) Until someone even stronger attacks and overpowers him. That, my friend, is not a defensive posture. Strips him of his weapons and carries off his belongings. He can have his belongings. I want our babies. I want God's children I want them to have an understanding that there is a right and a wrong. There is a higher power, and his name is God Almighty, and he has a son named Jesus Christ who empowers us through the Holy Spirit, who gives us victory over everything. God, be with us, and if God be for us, who can be against me? Amen. Amen. That is worthy of praise. I don't know about you, but I used to watch Indiana Jones. I I love some of those stupid movies. I like excitement. But one of the greatest ones, I think, was when he goes down in and they break out all of these little kids who have been taken from their moms and their dads and put into a a place down in the hole in the ground. And they're little slaves in that world. And these little kids are starving to death, but they're working themselves to the bone. And they come down and they set them free and they come running out. Let me tell you, whether you're six years old, eight years old, 28 years old, God wants to set you free. Those little guys, some of those little kids are living in abusive situations. God wants them to know there's a father who cares. 
They have a right to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. They have a right to it. I don't want you to think I'm dressing this up like some spiritual revelation. It has absolutely become so apparent to me. Having sat with our former superintendent, Terry and I would talk, and, and I could hear her heart cry for our kids. But I want to outline a critical part of what's going on in the days ahead. O end of October, we're going to have a, a wonderful time because October 31st is what? It's praise party day. It ain't Halloween. <laughs> Got you, didn't I? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You thought I wasn't thinking. Yeah. Pastor Lily is setting it up. She's the head honcho. I'm telling you, when Pastor Lily gets a hold of it, you better let go. She's going to take care of it. Okay? She made the, the VBS picnic an outstanding thing with the help of everybody here. October 31st, we're going to have a praise party. We're going to have 50 cars loaded up with candy. And, and honest goodness, if you have potlucks and luncheons and celebrations at night on birthdays with cooks, cookies and candy, and people will come. Well, let me tell you, the hook for kids is candy. How many like candy? See, I've hooked you all. We're going to have candy, but we're going to have the power team. They're going to be out there and on that night and probably going through Amherst and other places on Saturday. Sunday they'll be with us in a, in a wonderful time. And then on Monday and then on Tuesday and Wednesday, they're going to be with us. Those days we are going to penetrate every school with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Last time they were here and they went to three schools, they'd plan on being five. One guy forgot to put the date in for, for two assemblies and called them up the next day and said, I am sorry I missed. Please come back. Please come back. Please come back. Beloved, our goal is to get into every school in Stanley County, the littlest to the high schools all up. We're working those details even right now. But that doesn't come without a price. I'm not talking money. I'm talking prayer. I'm talking people who are, and I'm going to use a word that many people don't like to hear, volunteers. The greatest force in the world is a volunteer force. Do you realize that all the mi compassion ministries of our community, just about everyone, I can't think of really one that's not, they're all led by churches and organizations who have a faith-based foundation? Our government of our city cannot take care of the homeless. It took the churches to do that. Our government, and I'm not beating up on our government, okay? If the church is doing what we ought to be doing, we wouldn't have any homeless. If the church was doing what we ought to do, we wouldn't have welfare. If the church was doing what we ought to be doing, we would be teaching people how to fish, not just eat it. I'm going to tell you a, a startling number, and you're going to look at me and say, I can't believe that. With all the churches in America, think about this, all the churches, there's lots of them. There's almost 15,000 Assembly of Gods, and probably four or five times more of that are Baptists and Methodists and some of the other mainliners. That sounds like a drug, doesn't it? Mainliners. Hmm. Just a thought. If every church took one person, one family that's on welfare and nurtured them, cared for them, developed them, you wouldn't have welfare. You wouldn't need it. You know what? The church didn't do what they ought to be doing. And the government took it over. And when the government took it over, they'll mess it all up. It's a given. I mean, who else would build a bridge to nowhere? Think about it. Who else would put fans out in, some, in the desert and not have a way to get it someplace? Uh, just, just thoughts, free, but that's true. And I'm not saying it's one party or another. They're all ignorant. 
And sometimes you can't fix stupid. It's just the way it is. That was a paid political announcement. No, it was not. <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> I don't know what you said, but it must have been funny. Here's what I know, getting back to where I want to be. I believe that God has given us a place in our community that they, they desire us to have influence in a good way. God has done that over the years, and I think it is time that we begin to not just on the edges step in, but step right into the middle of where it's all happening. I'm watching it. It's no longer a weekend warrior mentality. I was saying that in prayer. How many know what weekend warriors are? They show up on Saturday or Sunday, but they aren't here the rest of the week. I believe God has called us to be an active army of God's infiltrating and taking back the land for him. Amen. Thank you. That will require transformed thinking. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants to transform us. How many have ever been on a diet and, was, and when, you, when, when that time was over, you were happy. Now I can go back and eat. Huh? But when you're transformed and then you go through that process of changing your pattern of life, I want you to know something. That's not easy, but when it's done, you have a new way of living. God is going to transform us, work in our lives, and it is going to knock the rough edges off of a lot of us, including your preacher. Because it's so easy to get comfortable coming into a sanctuary, worshiping for an hour or so, listening to me talk a little or somebody else, and then leave, and it just says, wow, it felt good. Well, there's more to life than feeling good. So I believe that we need to be inwardly strong. I'm going to talk about that. But we need to be outwardly focused. We are a church where you can belong and a place to become. But God has called us to beyond the walls. And God is saying to me, he said, no, I want you behind the walls. I want you in enemy territory. I want you where everything has to be me or nothing gets done. So I want to look at some things because I think it's important. God has called us to be the soul and the conscience of our, our community. You've heard me say that many times. He's called us to work in our communities, to be salt, light, and even the leaven. And it's not about us. It's about him. So I want to focus for just a few minutes on three things. A strong and focused church to them, good deeds and the good news are not separable. Did you hear me? Let your light so shine that men will see your good works and what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's God's word. If you're a believer, God has saved you to spend you. You have come into his army. You have become part of his family, adopted into his family. And he has things he wants you and me to do. Anybody ever have chores when you were growing up? Hmm? How many ever got paid for doing your chores? Not me. No, 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 no. I said to that to my dad one time. I said, Dad... You know, some of my buddies, they get paid for making their bed and taking out the garden. He says, honey, I put that roof over your head and I put food in your tummy. You get your butt out there and get to work. That was a preacher said that. He said, now, when you start earning it, you don't have to do anything, but you won't have much either. If you're part of a family, how many know somebody's got to enter, empty the trash? Somebody needs to make the beds. Hmm? If you've got kids growing up and they want to get paid for doing everything, I'll pay my grandbabies for reading five extra books and getting wiser and more intelligent. 
I'll pay my grandbabies for going over and helping somebody like a neighbor cut their yard. But, honey, when you live in my house, you're going to partake. <laughs> I'm, that's, that's, good, that's good counseling. Let me tell you why. We have raised a ki kids today who think they need to get paid for even thinking. And that's stinking thinking. We need our kids to realize being part of a family has responsibilities. And many hands make light the loads. I heard that when I was, I mean, knee-high to a grasshopper. I never have forgotten that. And when I'm out in the yard working or doing things like that, I said, well, it would really bring more people by this. It would really be a lot easier if all of us did this. How I many remember Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn? Oh, way. Oh, there are a couple of you remember that. God bless you. You make work look so much fun that everybody wants to do it, and then you just sit down. No, that's not how it works. You cannot separate your God deeds, your good deeds, from God's good news. They go hand in hand. If you find somebody hungry before they will receive the message of Jesus Christ, you might want to put something in their tummy. We do that. I'm going to cover some of that. And here's what I know. I mean, I've learned it over years. He's called us to serve the people on the margins of life, those who are the rejects, the throwaways, the people that nobody has time for. Now, give me a couple examples of who that is. Groupings. Anybody? Who are the marginalized? Who are the rejects? Homeless, Homeless. yes. Addicts. Addicts, absolutely. The who, what, what? Oh, alcoholics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, violence, yeah. Domestic violence. The poor. People out of jail, and nobody will hire them. The marginalized. Let me tell you one other group. The children. Because the world today, moms and dads, don't have time for their babies. Absolutely. Seniors who are forsaken, left out there to, to hang on. Absolutely. On a fixed income, that isn't a lot. Beloved, God has called us to minister to those. And here's one of the things that I was going to tell you. People who serve are happy. People who don't fall by the wayside. You can't grow if you're not involved in ministry and service. Here's what I, I made a note. What was the first miracle Jesus did? Isn't it amazing we know that? He didn't heal a sick person. He didn't raise somebody from the dead. Hmm? He didn't open a blind eye. What did he do? He saved a party. <laughs> Think about it. Does he heal the blind? Does he raise the dead? Does he, hmm? Does all that stuff. But his first miracle was to save a party. It was a community affair. Now, I'm not one who drinks, but I want you to know something. The church has to be more than just people wanting to go to the party. They need to be part of the party. Number one, good deeds, good news are inseparable. Number two, a strong and focused church sees ourselves vital to our community. How many think that we're pretty important to this community of believers and even unbelievers? I do. Let me just share some things. I believe that our, that, that our communities with all of its aspirations and challenges cannot truly be healthy without the involvement of the churches. I'm not just talking about First Assembly. It's only when church and the spiritual part, fiber of a community is mixed in the very life and conversation of a community that that community can be truly healthy. 
Otherwise, you get skewed. Too long, the church has allowed themselves to be culturally marginalized. And we've built ourselves a fortress, churches in which we don't let anybody else in. And God says it's not about letting us in. It's about you getting out. I saw this little phrase and it caught my attention. The church has become a spiritual consumer focused on how our own personal needs are being met by the church leader, leaders rather than being difference makers. We need to stop emulating, here it is, self-defeating secular consumer mentality attitudes and start showing and telling people of a, a marvelous God. What do we have at First Assembly? And I thought about this. What do we bring to a table as a community of believers. I believe we're invaluable. When I begin to run down the list of things that we're involved in, the organizations, this is scary. We've got folks that we support as a church financially as well as in other ways. The Stanley Community Christian Ministries, the Community Inn. In fact, our young people, our legacy is overfeeding the folks at the, the Community Inn today. If it wasn't for compassion ministries and mercy ministries, I want you to know something, people would starve. We have folks involved in pregnancy resource, in the Habitat for Humanity, Homes for Hope, Esther House for women who have been abused and domestic violence. I could run down more. We offer help for people who need their lives transformed. Pastor John Murray and, and the group that, that, uh, that he lead with him in Victorious Overcoming, Divorce Care and Divorce Care for Children by Kathy Morris and by Barb, Barb uh, Thomas. Let me tell you what, those ministries are making a difference in our community. Do we minister inside the walls? Absolutely. We've got wonderful teachers. We've got wonderful folks working in this fellowship. But the, when people come through those doors, God has blessed us to have opportunities to change lives. Then we have folks involved in the Butterfly House and our doctors and our nurses. I could just name them all who have a part, are part of the community care for those who don't have insurance, but they need help. Some of you even serve Meals on Wheels. I started to tell the joke about the, the cat and the mice in heaven, but I won't. Most of you probably already know that. We bring leadership into our community. We've got folks in our, in our city councils, our school boards, community organizations like Rotary and others, Chamber of Commerce. God has allowed us to step into those leadership roles and use godly men and women to set a direction. I can't leave out our law enforcement. The other night we had a wonderful time. If you weren't there, <clears throat> I told you I'd spank you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Tuesday night, it was a tremendous time, an incredible good showing. But if you weren't there, this is my priestly spanking. Okay, you got that. <laughs> Stacy told me how to spank like that. I don't know where he got it, but I liked it. Our law enforcement, our court system, thank God for godly men and women in those systems. You say, well, you know, they're not all that truly godly and everything in the police force. Let me tell you what, when, a police for, or when the police force, when the sheriff and those folks pull together and say, we want to we pray and we want you to pray for us. Beloved, if we don't stand with them, what we've said is we don't really believe God can change anything. It's not about just being there on Tuesday night. It's about praying for those in leadership over us. The highest office in this, in, voted on in this county is the sheriff. And when the sheriff calls for prayer, beloved, we ought to pray. Our weapons are not carnal. But they are mighty to the pulling down of the strongholds of the enemy. Think about it. They're weapons of God. JFK said this, and he challenged America over 50 years ago. Some of you won't even remember it, but I do. Some of you will. Ask not what you can do for your country, but ask what you can do for, ask, 
That's not what you, that's not for what the country can do for you, but ask what can you do for the country. I turned that around a little and said, ask not what God can do for you, ask God what can you do for him. That's critical. Finally, I believe a strong and a focused church is salvation oriented. If you're going to fight this war, it can't just be to drive out darkness. It has to be to bring salvation in. If you're at war, there's two ways you win a, a war. There, and there's no in-between. All you have to do is look at Vietnam and look at ISIS and all that stuff. Afghanistan. If you're going to win a war, number one, you have to either have to win their hearts or you have to annihilate them. There's no in-between. I've studied this thing way too long. You don't get in-between ground. Otherwise, you're going to have a revolution welling up from inside. <laughs> Be good back there. <laughs> Listen to me. God wants us to win the hearts of men and women. That's salvation. That is the plan of God. If we're going to invade and take on the darkness of this world, it is not just to be a little light and then leave it. It is to come in and bring people to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. They may not accept it, but our core value as a church is that every man, woman, boy, and girl has a right to hear the message of Jesus Christ and make a choice. You and I don't make their choices. But God, if we will be the messenger that he has called us to be, we can influence their understanding of what a real Christian looks like, what godliness is all about. Mm. Let me spend a few moments, and I sort of have already. I, I came across a, one neat slogan, and it's out in a vineyard community church in Cincinnati, Ohio. It said this. It's carved in a stone at the entrance. It says, small things done with great love will change the world. Small things done with great love will change the world. I believe that. We aren't, God isn't asking us to do everything. He's asking us to do something. So allow me to spend a couple moments. I'm almost finished. I mentioned the Power Force is coming back for the 30th anniversary with us. They're bringing six of their mighty, strong men. May even have a lady. They're going to get into the schools. And we're working now with our superintendent, principals, orchestrating this thing to get everything greased and worked so we can be there. I need you to pray. I need you to pray for favor with men and women in our school systems, that the doors will be opened. And not only that, but as the days move forward, because we're going to move into 40 days of fasting and praying as a church. We've done that before, and God has done incredible things. But I don't take it for granted. We have to say to God, we're serious about our kids. We have to say, Lord, I want to know you better. And he says, I'm going to show you me better. And I'm going to speak to you. What I know is that we're going to do things not just to have an event. I don't believe God has called us to do events. Oh, they're tied to it. But I think it's a part of God's process and his timing. We're going into the next three months. School starting. September missions emphasis. Pray about what God wants to do. And then during that time, we're going to be in prayer and fasting. End of October is when the team comes in. And I'm going to ask us to begin to pray that God will open the doors of every school in this county. Every school. How many have kids in school? How many have grandkids in school? How many have nieces and nephews? It's, it's, it's us. We've left everything to the teachers, and God says, you're part of the problem if you're not part of the solution. And then as we move into this time of prayers, I'm, not today, I'll, I'll fill you in when we start. But as we move into this time of prayer, I'm going to ask you to begin, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Pick the phone up and encourage those principals. Encourage the teachers. Encourage. Am I making sense? 
See, leadership works it from the top. You and I, we work it right from the grassroots up. And when the two collide, I want you to know something, the same voice is heard. It can be the voice of God. It can be hearts who've cried out and said, I see that God is doing something. They'll begin to talk about it. They'll begin to say, you know, I've had folks say, hey, come on, let's do something. Let's make something good happen in our community. Let me move on with the next part. Once we're inside the walls, and this is where we all come in, big time. Once I believe God has breached the walls through the power force, you and I have to come alongside. Some of the things I've heard, don't know everything, but I do know that much of our education, teachers have to carry the burden of paying for their materials for their kids. Is that true? We as a church, every, church, every teacher in this body of believers, I don't care if you're an assistant, but they're not paying assistants. Isn't that amazing? Or some, I guess they are. Not many. They don't have the finances. Isn't that the way an education system works? Shouldn't. But we're going to give every one of our teachers $500 to help them take care of their kids. Our kids. Hmm? Does that make sense? If you're a teacher, lift up your hand. One, two, three, four, five. There's more than that. I think last, last time I counted, we had like a dozen. Beloved, six, seven. I want you to know something. We're not going to let them do this thing by themselves. But pastor, that's, that's money. Well, yeah. Yeah. If it was your daughter, if it was your son, if it was your husband, how would you like somebody to help them? I would. If my daughter was a teacher, I'd love somebody to come alongside because teachers don't get all that much money. But together we can do greater things. That's one thing we're going to do. Another thing we're going to do is on, work, on, on teachers' work days, I didn't figure this one out. Betty O'Neill helped me with this and helped us in, as we were talking about it. She says, you know, the, the only time they really get a break is on their work days when they're doing their own work and they don't have to take the kids and all to eat and they only get 15, 20 minutes because they're corralling all the kids. I've never corralled cats, but I guess it's got to be pretty tough. So on their work days, when they take those, we're going to have some fish fries, and we're going to spoil them. We're going to say to our teachers, we love you. What do you think? I know I'm sharing something with you. Amen. And then we're going to see... As God speaks to us, how many are retired? Anybody retired? I retire at 9 o'clock every night. <laughs> and then I refire in the morning. Not a bad idea. Here's what I want. We need folks that will be willing to go two hours, three hours, maybe four hours, maybe a whole day. I don't know. I'm going to do it. I want to go and sit and help my teacher. And if they need somebody to run copies, I'll run copies. If my teacher needs me to take somebody to the restroom and stand guard for them or whatever, I'll do that. We've already got some folks in our church who do that on their off work days. So you don't have to be retired. Some of you get days off. Wouldn't it be an awesome thing to be able to sit in a class and strengthen a teacher's efforts with our kids? I think it would be awesome. See, this is not just going in and doing it one time. This is not only are you breaching the walls, you're infiltrating. Well, Pastor, do you have an ulterior motive? motive? I do. I really do. Yeah. I want every kid to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I want every little one that has no hope to find hope in somebody greater than anything around them. I want them to realize it's not what kind of shoes you have. It's the kind of little heart you have that somebody loves you enough to care for you. If you need food, we'll figure out how to get you some food. If you need peanut butter and jelly, we'll figure out how to get you peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Let me tell you, you want to change the atmosphere of a school, begin to love the kids. Begin to love the teachers. Instead of criticizing, instead of belly aching, instead of finding fault, somewhere that's in the Bible. Now, we can talk about being authentic, real authentic people. You can tell it. And God wants us not to do this out of duty, but because we're part of the army of God. I came across, and I'm, I'm done. Oh, I'm really early for my first closing. No, I'm joking. God wants us to more than just talk about things and change. He wants us to make a difference, and you know that's where I'm at. I came across this illustration, and the title of it was, It's Not About the Donkey. It's not about the donkey. How many remember the story in Matthew 21 when the donkey was carrying Jesus triumphantly into Jerusalem? Y'all remember that? Jesus gets on the little donkey, and he's riding into Jerusalem. As they're coming in, they're saying, hail, hail. The donkey's moving right along, and they throw down little palm branches in front of him. The donkey goes tramping over those palm branches. They ran out of palm branches and little leaves and all that stuff, and they threw down their coats, and that donkey thought he was somebody. He keeps on prancing through there, and finally he hears, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and then the donkey realizes I'm not, I'm not the messenger. I'm just the carrier of the message. He's on my back. Beloved, it's not about us. Everything I've been talking about is not about us. It's about the one who has the message, who is the messenger, who is the Christ. It's about Jesus. It's about a God who loved the world that he sent his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. Beloved, every one of us needs to have a place of service in the kingdom of God. Every one of us. 